sorry, I killed that girl. Officials say at this point they have not been able to positively identify the voice of the caller. Why did he call the police? Why did he increase the chances of being caught? Then, an 11-year-old spins a shocking story after shooting his friend. A father makes a chilling confession, and an inmate calls 911 instead of taking a shot at freedom. In the early 1980s, a Minnesota serial killer couldn't stop himself from repeatedly calling law enforcement to confess his crimes. This infamous murderer would later become known as the Weepy Voiced Killer. I'm sorry, I killed that girl. I can't stop myself. If I get locked up, I'll kill myself. In June 1981, a group of teenagers made a gruesome discovery while playing in a field. Near a freeway construction site in St. Paul, they stumbled upon the body of a young woman. It was immediately apparent she had suffered brutal injuries, with wounds to her chest, stomach, and inner thighs. The medical examiner later determined she had been stabbed a total of 61 times with an ice pick. The crime scene held no clues for investigators. Then, 48 hours later, an anonymous phone call came through to the police station. At first, they thought it was a prank call. Oh, you, you find me, I just stabbed somebody with an ice pick. I can't stop myself. I keep killing somebody. Except the person on the other end said two words that stuck out. Ice pick. Nobody would have known this was the murder weapon except for the killer, and the call was too short to trace. The victim was a recent high school graduate, 18-year-old Kimberly Compton. She had moved from Wisconsin to look for a job that same day. A second call came in two days later. This time, police were able to track it to a phone booth at a bus depot. Don't talk, just listen. I'm sorry what I did to Compton. I couldn't help it. Don't know why I had to stab her. I am so upset about it. I keep getting drunk every day. I can't believe it. It's a big dream. I can't think of being locked up. I'll try not to kill anybody else. By the time police arrived, the suspect was gone. With two calls confessing to murders coming through on the same day, investigators listened to the station's backlog of recorded phone calls. They were hoping to match the voice to other unsolved crimes. Finally, they did. On New Year's Day, five months earlier, someone called at 3 a.m. In that same weepy voice, they asked the police to send a squad and ambulance to Malmberg Manufacturing Company and Machine Shop. Yes, please, this is an emergency. Please send a squad to uh, Malmberg Manufacturing Company Machine Shop. Please, there's an ambulance, too. There's a girl hurt there. Can you tell me what happened to her? There's hurry. There's a, she's laying on the ground in the back by the, by the railroad tracks, by the edge of what, What's the address? I don't know. Who are you? At the location, authorities found Karen Potek beaten and stripped nude in a snowbank. The 20-year-old college student sustained multiple wounds to the head and neck area, exposing her brain. She had suffered the horrific attack but experienced brain damage and remembered nothing about the assault. With the serial killer on the loose, police needed to make an arrest, so they released a portion of the phone call to the media, encouraging the public to come forward with any information, but unfortunately, not a single credible tip-off was made. Then, the weepy-voiced killer went quiet for more than a year. While doing his morning deliveries on August 6, 1982, a paperboy saw a woman's body along the banks of the Mississippi River in Minneapolis. The victim, 40-year-old nurse Barbara Simons, had been beaten and stabbed. Again, the wounds were circular, meaning the weapon was either a screwdriver or an ice pick. The way the crime scene was covered up showed detectives that the killer was likely a repeat offender. Two days later, police received a call with another chilling confession. Please don't talk, just listen. I'm sorry I killed that girl. I stabbed her 40 times. Kimberly Compton was the first one. Oh my chief. I don't know what your name is. If somebody dies with a red shirt on, it's me. I killed both of you. It was time to bring in the FBI to profile the suspect. 
Barbara Simons went to the Hexagon Bar in Minneapolis on the night she was killed. There, a bartender and waitress saw her talking with an unidentified white man. Simons told one of the waitresses, I hope this guy's okay because I just need a ride home. From the witness's suspect description, police managed to narrow down mugshots of offenders with a history of violent assault to an eight-photo lineup. From there, the bar staff identified Paul Michael Stefani. The man had also worked at the Malmberg Manufacturing Company, where Podek had been attacked on New Year's Day. Paul became the main suspect, and a surveillance team was set up. However, while following him from his residence on August 21st, they lost track of him. Several hours later, another attack was called in. A man had witnessed a woman being stabbed with a screwdriver. The witness tried to intervene, but the suspect threatened him and then fled the scene in his car. The victim was 21-year-old Denise Williams. She survived the attack and told police that while working as a sex worker, the suspect had offered to drive her home. But somewhere in East Minneapolis, he pulled the car over and stabbed her 13 times. Denise found a glass bottle in the car and smashed it across his face, giving her a chance to escape before the witness called for help. The 21-year-old also identified the attacker as Paul Stefani. Not long after that, another call came in from the suspect himself. I'm all cut up. I got get up. Get up. Where are you bleeding from? From my arm, my face, my head. When police interviewed Paul Michael Stefani, he told them he was a robbery victim. And when the detective confronted him with the file full of victims' photographs, Paul stood up and said, you're not going to pin those on me. Little did he know that the change in his frustrated voice would tie him to the recordings. The 38-year-old was then charged with the assault of Denise and the murder of Barbara. He pleaded not guilty. The attack seemingly followed after Paul's girlfriend returned to her home country of Syria for an arranged marriage. Shortly before that, he divorced his wife and abandoned his daughter. During his trial in the Simons murder case, Paul's ex-wife, sister, and a woman who lived with him identified him as the weepy-voiced killer. Although he was convicted on both counts, he would later offer a confession to law enforcement. After over a decade behind bars, serving 18 years for the attack on Denise and 40 years for Barbara's murder, Paul Stefani said he would tell them what happened. In return, he wanted a photograph of his mother's headstone. During the admission, Paul spoke about another murder, However, all he could remember was that he had drowned her in a bathtub. Investigators had no other identifying information. St. Paul Police Department officer Keith Mortensen said they found a match after researching freshwater drownings in the time frame he was talking about. 33-year-old schoolteacher Kathleen Greening was found dead in her bathtub on July 21, 1982. The specific details Paul had given were facts only the killer would know. In the victim's address book, they found Paul S., along with his phone number. She was his third victim. Over the years, the motive behind the brutal murders remained unknown. However, the killer told the media that a voice in his head told him, Paul, it's time to kill. As for the 911 calls and confessions, those were religiously motivated. Paul's mother was a devout Catholic woman who told him, if something hurts you, go to God. The weepy-voiced killer was diagnosed with terminal cancer and died on June 12, 1998, at the Oak Park Heights Maximum Security Prison Infirmary. When an 11-year-old shot another child, he and his brother spun a story far from the truth. Tell me exactly what happened, okay? Uh, my son called me, he was screaming, crying, said he shot his friend because he came at him with a knife. That's all I was told. They were screaming, crying. Okay, I need you to go over to him and I need you to check his pulse, okay? He does not have a pulse. I'm no pulse? Right now. He does not have a pulse. Is he breathing? No, he's not. All right, where is his injury to? I, I can't really tell. It looks like he was shot. Okay, I understand he was shot. Do you know where the, no, he was shot at? Look. I, it looks like he was shot in the hip. In the hip? All right, we're going to go ahead and start CPR, okay? Oh, my God, no, he was shot. Oh. He was shot in the head? Yes, oh, my God, oh, my God. All right, is he beyond any help? Not 
breathing. Sorry. She doesn't have a pulse. In December 2018, 14-year-old Jaden Vaughn was visiting the Columbia County home of the 11-year-old boy and his brother. The adults went out for the evening, leaving the children alone. According to detectives, Jaden and the 11-year-old boy began play wrestling to try and see if the family dog would respond to Jaden attacking him. After that, the 11-year-old went and got a pistol from his parents' room, removed the magazine, and pointed it at Jaden before the gun discharged and killed him. The child then called his father and told him that the victim had come at him with a knife. He and his 13-year-old brother later admitted to placing a kitchen knife near Jaden after the shooting, believing they would be in less trouble. The 11-year-old was arrested and held in juvenile detention in Gainesville. A month later, two adults, 28-year-old Sierra Watts and 31-year-old Jordan Palm, were charged with improperly storing two loaded firearms, a Ruger 89 handgun, and a Ruger EC-9S handgun. If found guilty, the couple could face a year in prison. The outcome of their cases is unpublished. Well, somebody actually help, really help them, okay? Because y'all did help me. A desperate father called 911, but then he made a chilling confession. Durham 911, where's your emergency? I don't know. You gotta use a GPS tracker. I just get to them, both of my dogs. All right. Okay, what's your. You gotta use a tracker. CPS was trying to take my kids away from me. All I did was try to go get help because I was dealing with some things. Okay. Okay, are you going to mom right now? I was dealing with some sexual disasters. I tried to go get help with but instead, they turned their back on me, the whole system, and tried to take my kids. And I, that took the rest of the little happiness that I had. So y'all take this and y'all learn from me. When somebody asks for help, really help them, okay? Okay, so what? Really help them. Let me get your business. Because y'all didn't help me. I don't know where I'm at. I don't know. Use the GPS on the call. I need somebody to go and break the news for my wife. I need an ambulance out there. She's going to be in shock. Okay, where's she? She's going to be in shock. She's, she's in Raleigh. I'm in Durham right now. Okay. She, your wife's in Raleigh? Yes. What's your wife's phone number? Uh, I, I don't know it right now. I just need the police. Okay. I need the police. Let, let me get your description, okay? What do you look like? Are you white, black, Hispanic? Uh, I'm black. I'm a light complete. I'm light skinned black guy. I'm kind of slim build. Okay. And what are you wearing? I'm wearing a blue shirt and khaki pants, please send an ambulance. My daughter is in a lake drowning. Both of my young daughters, five to three years old. What lake? What lake? I don't know. It's over here <laughs> behind a Hermes Teeter, behind a Hermes Teeter and, a, and a Rose is off of Highway 54. You said behind the Hermes Teeter and Rose? Yes. In September 2015, police were dispatched to the Raleigh home of 29-year-old Alan Paisheen Eugene Lassiter shortly after 9 p.m. Meanwhile, an off-duty Durham County Sheriff's deputy pulled two girls, a three-year-old and a five-year-old, from the lake. Once they arrived, the responding officers performed CPR on the children until emergency services got there. Lassiter's seven-year-old son escaped and ran to a nearby business for help. The two girls were hospitalized, but sadly, the three-year-old girl later died. A neighbor said the news of the incident was shocking and that the apartment complex is usually quiet. In 2019, the accused defense attorney tried to plead insanity, but the jury found Lassiter guilty of first-degree murder and the three-year-old's death and two counts of attempted first-degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison with no parole options and an additional sentence of up to 15 years for attempted murder. Lassiter didn't show much emotion during the hearing, including when the verdict was read or when he learned he would spend the rest of his life in prison. The jury foreperson said jurors never wavered in their decision. The act was disturbing on every level. The prisoner who escaped and called 911 won't be counting on popularity in jail to save him. 911, what's your emergency? Uh, yes, man. You're probably not going to believe this, but um, I'm a prisoner in a van, and I'm here with a couple of other cats and a couple 
couple of the guys that were in the van jacked the van. We were at the hospital. I stole the Where van. are you, sir? Uh, Weatherford. I have no idea where we're at because we're in a PTS, like all over the country. We're on transport extradition back to a couple different states. Where are you at, sir? Where are you? Uh, we're in Weatherford. I, I mean, I don't want to leave the van, so I'm not going to walk up because we pulled into some like, little like grass alley. And they like they came to they stopped and like and we were gonna. Just, I was just going to leave it alone. We were just going to leave it alone. But we voted on. Sir, I just need to know where you are. I understand you're I, in Weatherford. I, I can't tell you that. I don't know. We're in we're in Oklahoma somewhere. I don't know because we're not on the road and I'm not from here. We're back in some some yard and they. You know, I mean, you want me to walk to the corner because I, I just don't want to get shot by no cops or nothing. Sir, There's guns in the van and shit. And... You know what? I appreciate your phone call, but the only thing I can do to help you is to know where you are. What was? Do you okay, see well, anything saying, like, around I'll walk, you? I'll walk. I'll walk to the road, but I just want it to be noted that I'm in the van right now and I'm shackled up. It's not going to look good walking to the uh, the street. Because they they opened the doors and and they 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 busted through one of the doors. We we're at we we're at the um hospital. One of the guys had an emergency. Sir, sir, I'm, we I'm know. walking there right now. I'm okay, just we know okay, just, we know the situation. We just need to know where you are. Okay, well let me. I just don't want to get All right, you, you notify that dispatcher, or police, or whatever that I'm walking. So I don't. Hate I will. There. I will let them know. Okay. All right, I just I'm need to know your I'm, location. I'm, I'm trying to walk. I'm trying to walk. There's not even any cross streets. Um, there was a. Uh, well, behind. Well, if if you turn by Little Caesars, uh, if you turn right, because I mean, we went there for lunch. Um, if you're coming from the hospital on the frontage road, and you turn right, leaving the hospital, and you go down that frontage road about a mile. There's a big camper in front of me. I'm still walking. I'm just I'm shackled up and I can't walk fast. Where are the rest of the prisoners? And we're all in the van. The, the two of the dudes took off. Two of the, like the, the two dudes that. We're doing whatever they were doing. They took off. They took off and, and they, they they unlocked their shit and they grabbed their property and they took off. They unlocked their shit, grabbed their property, and took off. Yeah. On they, foot, sir? What's that? They're on foot? Yeah, they're on foot. There's two of them. Okay, so you said turn right by Little Caesars. Yeah, hold on. Hold on a second. There's a, there's a, um, a stop ahead sign. There's a couple there's a, of brown... There's red brick buildings. Hold on a second. Hey. Hey. Stop. No one wants to stop. There's the cops are right here. The cops hey. are right there? The cops are right here. Hey. Come here. Sir, are you chained? Here. You're chained, right? I got them right here. I got, I got a Swap 2 Park Ranger right here. Swap 2 right Park here. Ranger. The bank's back here. Swap 2 Park Ranger. Ranger. You're, You're right there with our Swap inmate. Swap 2 Park Ranger. Where's it at? Hey, get on the radio. Get on the radio. Get in there. Move that. All right, get in there. Who is this? Sir, hello? Hey, sir, we got it under control. This is 911. Who is this? This is a uh, park ranger here at Weatherford. This We're is the the right Weatherford PD. Where are you? We are uh, right north of the point in Weatherford. North of the point in Weatherford. Swasu has an yeah, inmate. The point north of the shot. point of Weatherford. Swasu has an inmate. We got it. We're here. Okay, I'm just letting other officers know where you are. Uh, I gotta get off here. We're on the radio. Okay. In Weatherford, Oklahoma, Joshua Silverman was given a chance to flee when two other inmates hijacked the van he was transported in. Unexpectedly, instead of making a run for it, he dialed 911 and alerted the police about the escape. Guards from the Prison Transportation Service drove the security vehicle to the hospital to drop off ill inmates. But, while they accompanied the sick prisoners, the other eight stayed in the car, unsupervised. And the keys were in the ignition so the inmates would have air conditioning. Two decided to take the chance to escape and kicked out a partition in the van before moving up front and driving off. About a mile later, the inmates ditched the vehicle to flee on foot. However, Silverman, one of the six inmates left behind, was reluctant to escape. He was still shackled when he called 911. He was originally in custody on drug-related charges and was being taken to Wisconsin when the van was hijacked. Court records indicate the prisoner had been convicted of bail jumping, drug manufacturing, and disorderly conduct over the past few years. Thanks to the inmate, police were able to locate Burns and Coleman faster. They were recaptured and taken back into custody. For more True 911 calls, watch this episode next.